Yep, there I am, screen share. So here we go from the beginning. Right, so Grammy, prepare the breakout rooms if you can, please. Three to a room of 15 minutes while I just begin the uh, little bit at the beginning, okay? So here we are, we are, uh, wanting to love bigger, better, wider. You know, we were talking a, a lot yesterday and the bottom line on, on Zoom and the bottom line of everything was love. Against that, there is no law. And what we are doing, we are going and making disciples, meeting them at their point of need, introducing them to Christ, praying with them as the Holy Spirit gives us unction. Right, so here's our exercise um, or that we are going to do. Um, we're going to go into our breakout rooms to discuss a time when you needed support and the comments that you received. How helpful were the comments? And what would you have preferred to hear? So when we come back after the breakout rooms, I want you, every one of you to sort of just put out there, what did you want to hear from people when you were broken, when you were hurt, when you were damaged, when you were struggling, what did you need from people? And that, that's the exercise. So uh, Remy, if you are ready, you can uh, put us into our breakout rooms. Okay, so just as a quick wrap up, you know, when people are feeling really battered down in a struggling place, throw in a whole lot of things of them of do's and how to, what you should be is not helpful. The best thing you can do is, as people have said, is just listen. You're not the expert of their life. You don't know what's going on in their life. Listen, allow them, as Pranita said, allow them to be themselves uh, and not put any heavy on them of how they should perform. perform. So uh, yeah, just listening. And one of the things that um, I always do and I would encourage you to do is when they tell in this story, this is difficult. Uh, we will get through this together. Just knowing that there is somebody with you is sometimes the most helpful thing. Not telling you what to do, but just walking with you. And I'm going to get into the PowerPoint now. And we are going to be talking. Um, whoops, there we go. Um, right, just close that. What I want to share this time is understanding grief and grief support. So when you look at the time we are in, this country has had over, was it 200,000 deaths? Am I right? Yes, so something like that. It's, there's a lot of people out there that have lost a loved one. So grief is all about loss. And when somebody is grieving, what do you need to do? What do you need to uh, think about? And this is what we're going to do. Let's understand grief and grief support. So first of all, grief is a natural process of loss over time. And uh, it is important that we grieve. Um, I find today, because of the way society is geared, we tend to minimize the loss of a loved one. But it is a natural process that takes at least two years in many cases 
for a person to work through that grieving process. So a grief process takes two years and we must not minimize it. It must not be diminished. It must not be suppressed. Um, you know, to say, oh, you'll get over this is the worst thing you probably could say to anybody. What we're struggling with today is that our rituals of the grief process are being curtailed. So closure of a grief process is enhanced with ritual. Um, I was just working with one uh, person who has lost a <coughs> parent um, through uh, this time of COVID and the lockdown. And for her, that she couldn't meet with her family to go and choose the coffin that they couldn't get together to work out how they would like to have the a service, that they couldn't get together and, and conduct the service because it had to be stalled because they couldn't meet together. Um, the whole process also of taking some token like flowers, laying it down in some place, uh, maybe it's a grave if it's cremated or doing something, scattering the ashes. All these rituals help our psychological health uh, come to work through this grief process. So these rituals are very, very important. And there are various emotions that may often repeat. And these emotions are not generally in the same order for everybody, they are different. But there's a lot of emotions that people go with when they've lost a loved one, uh, especially if they've been together a long time, and especially at a time like this. So here we go through some of the emotions that we are going to experience. Generally, the first thing that people experience is a shock and a numbness. So when pe people are numb, they cannot receive. That's why we need to just be there with them. In that time of shock, just having somebody with them is the most important thing. Just that friendly gesture. Um, I know that in our group, Pranita said uh, she got a bunch of flowers from somebody and it was so meaningful, just a gesture to help them through the shock and the numb feelings. So people generally feel numb and especially if they have to arrange the funeral, you are caught up and you don't process the deeper feelings. Often there is withdrawal. So they withdraw, withdraw from uh, society. They withdraw from their friends. Uh, they withdraw from maybe the Zoom fellowship they're on. So we need to watch. If we've got somebody within our group or you are in some Zoom group and somebody has lost somebody through this last year of uh, lockdown, if they're not there, you should be aware of them not being there and maybe just send a encouragement text like, we've missed you. Is there anything you need, right? Often there is denial. And um, this comes up very, very strongly. And I'll just quote um, the case that it has been a long case um, uh, what's her name? Mad Maddie. Maddie uh, and her parents. They have obviously they haven't found any conclusive proof, proof if Maddie is alive or not. But those two parents are denying that there's the possibility of death. And that is taking a toll of them. So denial is one of the things we go to watch. And obviously you can't say anything about that, but you just have to be with them through the denial. This is what often happens is replacement. So we look for something to replace what we've lost. 
and often we have rebound. So you can also have a, a loss of in a marriage with a divorce. It is also a grief process. Uh, and what you find that people uh, can't work through that grief and quickly look for a replacement and they can get into another relationship that is an unhealthy relationship. They can also replace that person with alcohol or drugs. So watch that they are not replacing their grieving process so that uh, they uh, stall the grieving process by just trying to cover up with something else. So replacement is something you've got to be watch with, watch, watch over. Anger and regret. A lot of people can be very angry. They can be angry at the government because they're not allowed to have the funeral. They can be angry at the circumstances. They can be angry at the hospital. They can be angry at uh, the slowness of the ambulance. And then there's always regret. I should have. I remember the loss of my own father. Um, I was just 22. Um, he was going in for an open heart operation. I was saying, um, uh, meeting him the moment, um, I think it was the day before the next morning he was going to go into the surgery. And as I was saying goodbye, I thought, I should say, I love you, Dad. But I withheld that. I didn't say that. And he never, ever came out of the operation. He, he died uh, never regaining consciousness. And I regret that moment of not saying, I love you. And this regret thing, when you've lost somebody that I wish I had, can be something there that is difficult to work with. To continue with these emotions, there's often sadness and crying, which is very, very obvious. Uh, avoid the cliche. Please avoid the cliche. You should be happy. He's with Jesus. That is the worst thing you could possibly say. There's fear and anxiety. How I'm going to cope? Uh, what am I going to do? Especially if the spouse has been the one that's been managing a lot of the finances and now the wife has to now pick up where um, she hasn't been uh, involved on the front line, if I can put it that way. How am I going to manage? They need support. Um, and there is the, what's the word I'm thinking, where you have to go, uh, I can't think of the word, where you, you have to go to the lawyer and you have to be an executor and you have to uh, execute the will. All that is lots of fear, lots of anxiety. Uh, a loss of a breadwinner brings a lot of anxiety and fear. So we need to notice that. People then also do a shutdown. They go into ambivalence. So there's just this, it doesn't matter, I'm fine. Uh, and that is just a, a coping mechanism. And we got to watch that they are, when they're in that ambivalent stage, we need to be there because they're going to come out of the ambivalence at some stages. They're going to be triggered. And then they can go into the sadness, the crying, the fear, the anxiety, etc. And then through the period of time, there's a rationalization and an acceptance of the situation. Coming, making a closure. And as I say, this can take a two years before people get to a place of being able to put their lives together in another format. And then there's the adjustment. How do I do my life? How do I uh, do all the rituals that we do when you have a partner? Uh, eating together, sleeping together, uh, all those things. There, so there's quite a lot of adjustment that people have got to go through and they need somebody there with them all the time. Not telling them wonderful scriptures, 
by just being supportive. So what do we need to do in this grief support? And there's some very, very important things that we can do. Just be with the person. Don't minimize it. Don't say cliche words. Just be with them. This is tough. This is difficult. We will get through this together. Don't make patronizing comments. There, there, you will get over it. You know, that is horrible for that person. Check on the ability of self-care. And this is very, very important, especially when the husband loses his wife, his female partner. Because what we tend to have is she might be doing all the cooking, uh, managing the fridge. And because they go into a place of numbness, um, they're not checking on the uh, use by dates. And you can go into somebody who's struggling with going through the funeral and that just with their permission, go and check on their fridge. And you'll probably find all their cupboards and you can often find the bread's gone moldy. The milk is out of date. There's fish products that have half opened that are out of date. And, and that sort of thing, that ability of self-care. Um, are they opening their post? Are they looking at their bills? That sort of thing is very, very important, especially in the beginning stages. And what we often find with grief support, there's a lot of uh, comment and support in the uh, first few weeks, probably up to the funeral. But then there's a tendency for us to get on with our life. And then nobody's checking in on them. Nobody's checking in on how they're doing. And we need to be aware that the grief support is a period of time. Now, watch out for five-month blues. So what happens specifically if you've lost a, a significant other, a partner, is that in the beginning, you numb. You have to cope. You've got to do the funeral. You've got to do the rituals. You've got to sort out all the clothes. You've got to get rid of the clothes of the partner and somehow, which is sometimes an incredibly difficult thing to do. People will go open the cupboard. They're going to clean out the clothes, look at the clothes, close the door. They can't do it. You might have to do that for them. I was working with a woman. Uh, she had lost her husband in a tragedy. It had been five years. She still had all his shoes in the closet under the cupboard, uh, under the stairs, in the co uh, closet and the cupboard under the stairs. She could not get rid of them after five years. So watch out for the uh, five month blues because suddenly it hits them. They wake up one morning and they just in a low place. Also watch out for anniversary blues. blues. Christmas time is an incredible lonely time if you've lost a loved one. Uh, birthdays, um, their wedding anniversary, these things uh, suddenly they, they're feeling blue on that day. And I often, when I'm working with people, I will make a note in my diary. They've lost somebody. And I will make a note in my diary five months time. And it comes up in my diary and I will check in on them, uh, watch the, where they are, how they are coping emotionally. And when a person in, is in a, in a blue or a low mood, Telling them to go do all the things like we li like to do, like, uh, oh, why don't you pray or why don't you read the Bible or whatever. Just telling them is not a useful thing. Ask them, what would they like to do? Would they like to? Would you? they like you to uh, read the Bible with them? And if they say no, that's fine. Check on them. In on a regular basis. So that is grief and grief support, an ongoing thing that we can reach out to the world in 
at any time. So here we are into question time. 